Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending this seminar. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Professor George Craig uh, to be our seminar speaker. Uh, George actually grew up close by. He, he grew up in Canada, uh, initially in Alberta, at Alberta, and but then moved to Ontario and did both his undergraduate and graduate uh, studies at uh, the University of Toronto and worked with Professor Han Ru Cho. Cho. Uh, he got his PhD in 1991 and then moved to Reading University in the United Kingdom and stayed there uh, most of the time until 2002 when he moved to Germany and became the head of the cloud physics and transport meteorology uh, in, at the Institute for Atmospheric Physics at Oberfahrhofen. Yeah, it's difficult to pronounce <laughs> that name. And then he moved uh, in 2009 to uh, Munich, uh, the Ludwig uh, Maximilian University as a professor for theoretical meteorology and has been there since then. So uh, I came to know, um, to meet Professor Craig because uh, I actually participated a little bit in Pentoe, which is uh, the predecessor of the, the uh, Waves to Weather uh, project that Professor Craig uh, lead now, uh, which is the first successful uh, multi-institution collaboration in Germany uh, that, is, that actually uh, study uh, the dynamics and, uh, and predictability of weather, uh, which he's probably going to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, in his talk. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Drake. Can you share your screen now? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Just um, let's get this up. Okay, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm also happy that if one or two people keep their cameras on so I don't feel like I'm talking to a wall. But um, anyway, we'll see how that goes. So um, before I get started, I, I, I should actually thank um, my co authors, so especially Tobias Seltz and Michael Riemer. Um, as you can see, this work is a collaboration between people at in Munich and at Mainz, um, which is another university in Germany. Whoops. There, there we go. And as Edmund said, this is part of the Waves to Weather program, which is um, what they call a collaborative research center in Germany. And so this is the biggest sort of bottom up research program that you have in Germany. So it's where scientists can just say, this is an exciting problem, we'd like to do research on it, as opposed to sort of a top-down managed program. Um, and our goal is to really understand what limits the predictability of weather. And this, this is a big program. So we, 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 we hire about 30 scientists, PhD students and postdocs, um, runs for 12 years. The work that I'm going to be talking about today is really related to um, the first of our three research areas where we talk about upscale error growth, but we've also got people digging deep into the physics of clouds and other processes that make errors, and also looking at more practical issues of ensemble prediction, probabilistic forecasting, machine learning, and things like that. And if you wonder why um, I feel the need to tell people this stuff, um, it's because at the moment we're just writing our proposal for our third phase. So um, that means that if everything goes well, sort of the middle of the next year, a large number of these positions will be advertised and we'll be looking for people. So if you happen to know some students who might be interested in, in Germany next year, um, we would be really delighted to hear from them. Okay, but let's get on to predictability of weather. Ah, uh, oops, there we go. Okay, so the question is how long can we predict the, the will, how long can we predict the weather? And, and the problem is what do you mean by weather? Because different things can be predicted for different lengths of time and so on. So for the purposes of this talk, 
We're going to focus on the classic weather forecasting problem. So the thing that people have been thinking about for decades. So synoptic scale, pressure, temperature, wind, and so on. And to give an idea of the background of this, I've got a graph here, which is the skill of temperature forecast. This happens to be Melbourne in Australia. But the nice thing is they've, done, they've, they've, they've plotted the skill going right back to, to the 1960s, all the way up to the present. And the black line here is the one day temperature forecast, because one day is basically all they, all they dared to try in the 1960s. And what you can see is that through the 1960s into the 1970s, there wasn't really any systematic change in the skill, but somewhere in there, things started getting better and the forecasts have been improving ever since at a, at a pretty steady rate. And of course, they've also been starting to predict for longer lead times, three days and five days. And if you look at this, just the skill level here, you can see that nowadays the five day forecast is about as good as the one day forecast was 40 years ago, or sorry, yeah, 40 years ago. And this is a trend that you see that you see a lot in these kind of diagrams is we're getting better at forecasting at the rate of about one day per decade. So essentially 50 years over the history of numerical weather prediction. And, and this, this is a little bit like the Moore's law of weather forecasting in the sense that it's not really a law. This has been going on for ages. It's actually the sum of a whole lot of different innovations in different areas. There's actually a really nice review paper in Nature by Peter Bauer, who calls it a quiet revolution. But it's got something else in common with Moore's law. And that is that um, there are some physical constraints here. And we're pretty sure that this cannot go on forever. Okay, and of course I've drawn the physical constraint as a butterfly because what we're talking about here is the butterfly effect. Okay, let, let me just review a little bit of, of, of what sort of chaos in the butterfly effect ac actually is. So the, the, the seminal paper in this is one called deterministic non-periodic flow, non-periodic flow, sorry, um, from Laurent, Ed Lorentz in 1963. And basically, what he came across in this paper, what he, what he documented was the idea of chaos, which corresponds to sensitive dependence to initial conditions, okay? And that means that if you have small errors in the initial, small differences in the initial condition, they grow rapidly. And they grow rapidly in the sense that, in a, in a sort of average sense, ask Professor Lyapunov exactly, um, you get exponential error growth. So very rapid error growth of perturbations. And this means that these perturbations will grow and saturate in a finite time. So by saturate, I mean the two states will be so far apart that you, just, that you can't distinguish them from just random states um, drawn, for, drawn, drawn from the climatology. And you're gonna hit that in a finite time if you've got exponential growth. Okay, but something that people often don't realize about chaos, and in fact, this is probably something that I didn't realize until about 10 years ago or something like that, is you can, is that this is not a limit, you know? So when we say, well, we can predict the, the weather for like two weeks or a month or something, that's not what this theory is telling us. Because this theory says that if we decrease the amplitude, our initial condition error, then we'll hit saturation later and we can predict longer into the future. But let's explain that. I can explain that a little bit more. So the history of this is, so this is 1963. Lorentz was at MIT. Uh, Charney was also at MIT. Charney got very interested in this. Um, but of course, Lorentz had done all this in a very simple, simple idealized model. And Charney, so the story goes, went and persuaded all the numerical modelers who had GCMs, I say all of them, I think there were three at the time, um, to do this experiment, to perturb their initial conditions and see what happened, okay? And the results in fact were kind of all over the place. And so there's a really interesting report where you see a lot of, you know, the gears turning in Charney's mind as he took all these 
very weird numerical results and concluded that if it's going to be exponential growth, there's a doubling time of about five days. And if you take reasonable initial temperature errors, you know, a degree or a little less than a degree, the sort of thing you could measure, you'd have a limit of about two weeks to saturation. Okay. But these models were very primitive. They were very low resolution. I, th I think it was like two levels in the vertical and, and so on. So these experiments have been repeated a lot. And I, I think the state of the art nowadays is probably a study by Falco Yud from NCAR, who used global four kilometer simulations. So this is convection permitting. He can turn off the, the, the deep convection scheme here. And what he found was, um, a doubling time of 1.6 days, so rather faster than, than, than the early experiments were giving. But uh, this, this is pretty typical of what you get these days. But he started, so he had a faster growth time, but he started with much smaller perturbations. He started with sort of theoretically tiny perturbations of a hundredth of a Kelvin. So things that you wouldn't really be, expect to measure and still came out with two weeks saturation. Okay, so this is actually a graph of the error growth. So this is time in days on this axis, and this is difference total energy. So this is diff the difference between his two forecasts um, in an energy norm. And what you can see is through most of this period from two days or so on, you've got a straight line on this log linear graph. So that means exponential growth, right? That's the 1.6 day doubling time. And somewhere around two weeks, you intersect the climatological variance. And at that point, you've saturated your errors, okay? And the Lorentz theory would suggest that if this is what's going on, then if you make your initial errors smaller, you should essentially, oh, what's going on here? Sorry about that. You should be able just to pull this curve down, okay? And then it'll intersect the climatology later and you forecast for a longer period of time. But this is the question because when you look at this, actually, it's not just exponential growth right from the initial time. There's a period of very rapid initial growth here. Okay. And that's a question. Okay. And in fact, there's, there's something going on in the atmosphere involving these initial times that's actually worse than chaos. Okay, and Tim Palmer likes to call this the real butterfly effect. Um, of course, it still, it still goes back to Lorentz, but now we're talking about a Lorentz paper from 1969 called The Predictability of Flow Possessing Many Scales of Motion. And the many scales of motion is the key idea here. Because what Lorentz, the, the idea that Lorentz worked with is you don't have sort of one error growth in the atmosphere, you know, doubling time of five, doubling time of five days or something like that, errors on small scales, so small length scales grow faster, okay? And if they grow faster, that means they saturate faster. And what Lorentz suggested was that at later times, it's not the error growth time of the large scales that actually matters because the smaller scales will be influencing them upscale by nonlinear effects. And so you'll, you'll end up that as you make your errors smaller, you're, you're pushing your way down into where these very rapidly growing small scale er errors will have an effect and you get diminishing returns from improving your initial conditions. So it's worse than just exponential growth. Now, th th this paper is actually pretty difficult to read. Um, I remember somebody saying that, that Lorentz papers are like beef jerky. So they're really nutritious. They never go out of date, but you've got to chew and chew and chew to get the value out of them. So um, if you don't mind, I'd like to chew on this paper a little bit. Okay, let's have a look at the equations. Let's look at the model that Lorentz actually did. Okay, so what he did was he took a simple model of the atmosphere based on two-dimensional turbulence. So two-dimensional turbulence or is governed by the barotropic vorticity equation. So that means that changes in the vorticity are, being, are given just by advection. It's conserved following the motion. Okay, so what Lorentz did is he said, okay, then he made an equation for the error vorticity. So for the difference in vorticity of two states, 
And then he did some statistics on it, assuming all the usual homogeneous isotropic kind of assumptions that you make from turbulence. And he made an equation for the error kinetic energy as a function of scale. So for a given wave number K. And so what you do when you get that is you get these sort of triad interactions where if you wanna figure out how the error on a scale K is changing, it's gonna be influenced by the errors on all the other scales L plus a coefficient that has the energy of the mean flow at a different scale, okay? And so we're gonna to have to take a look at how these terms work. But Lorentz immediately pulled out two very, two very important conclusions from this. And if you really look for them, you can find them in Lorentz's paper, but actually they've been expressed a lot more nicely by some recent papers. So I'm gonna talk about that. Okay, the first point is that the energy spectrum of the flow is absolutely critical to this. So how much energy is in the large scales relative to how much energy is in the small scales? Okay, now, interestingly, back in the 1960s, Lorentz did not know what the energy spectrum of the atmosphere was. It hadn't been measured on, the, on these scales. I mean, nowadays we're, we're, we're all used to seeing this kind of diagram here, where we've got a K to the minus three energy spectrum on the synoptic scales, and then somewhere in the mesoscale, maybe 300 kilometers or so, it, it, it goes to a flatter spectrum with about a K to the minus five third spectrum. So that's what we know now. Lorentz didn't know that. So Lorentz just assumed a K to the minus five third spectrum for the atmosphere, okay? Now, if you do that, then you get this upscale growth and um, this point has been re really nicely presented um, by, by Rotuno and Snyder. So I've pulled a couple of pictures from their paper. So this is now the, the energy spectrum. So this is the K to the minus five thirds of the background. And then this little peak here, this is the initial error on the small scales. And so what you can see is the initial error on the small scales grows really fast. So in one time unit, it grows up to here. And then as time goes by, it grows, but the growth rate slows with time, okay? And this is, this, this is the, the key part of Lorentz's argument because what it means is, say I've, say I've got an error like this in my initial conditions, okay? If I then reduce my initial condition error by a certain amount, say down to here, okay, I get a big gain in predictability. It takes a long time for the errors to grow from here up to here, okay? If I then make the same change in error starting here and go down, then I'm about here and I gain very little predictability because these errors grow so fast that I, that I almost immediately jump right back up, up to there. And this is the essence of Lorentz's argument, okay? Because if you then say, I'll let my magnitude of errors go to zero, I'll take the limit, and what you find in Lorentz's model is that limit is a finite number. So in other words, no matter how accurate I make the initial conditions, there's a limit that I will never be able to predict further. And this is more than the usual chaos tells you. Okay, so that's really the key part of the argument. But of course, a lot of the relevant scale here is actually a K to the minus three spectrum. And what Rotuno and Snyder show is that this is the transition to a different behavior, okay? Now we've got a K to the minus three spectrum. Again, we put in errors that are saturated on a very small scale. And now what you see happens is it's not the smallest scale errors that are growing most rapidly because there's not much energy down there. Um, it's actually larger scale errors. And after a bit of an adjustment time, you end up in a period where you can see all these lines are evenly spaced. So in, 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 in log space, you get the same amount of growth per time interval. So this is exponential growth growing up, okay? And this is actually more what you expect from the usual chaos model, because if you're in this range, you improve your initial conditions by a certain amount, you can keep improving by a certain amount. And as long as you're in this range, you'll keep making um, the length of your accurate forecast longer. Okay, so the energy spectrum really matters, and it's kind of interesting that the energy spectrum is rather complicated in the real world. Okay, next up. Right, the next, the next point is that the initial scale of the perturbation in terms of its length is actually not very important. 
Okay, because we've been kind of mixing up two ideas of, of size here of the initial perturbations. One is the magnitude, so how much energy is in the initial perturbations, and the other one is the scale in terms of length, so large and small. And so to understand how the scale works, we've got to go back to those triad interaction terms in Lorentz's model, okay? And it turns out, well, actually, um, Rotuno and, and, and Snyder show this, is there's basically two different things going on there. Now, the classic thing that you think about for scale interactions and turbulence is something called the OR mechanism. So if you have a feature like this blue circle in the background here, which has a given scale to it, okay, and you put in an error or a wind speed that's that changes on a similar scale. That means that different parts of this blue circle will feel different wind speeds. And so what happens is you deform the circle, okay? And you create scales that are smaller and you create scales that are larger, okay? So this gives you an exchange between scales and, um, but it's local. So it's nearby scales that matter. If you have an error wind that's on a very large scale or a very small scale, it won't deform very much. And won't have much and, and won't have much effect. Okay. But okay, um, there's a subtlety here. So this this mechanism is, is just what goes on in triad interactions and turbulence. And when you think about turbulent cascades and things, it's this kind of thing going on. Okay. If you have a if you have though, say, a really large scale error wind, okay, a really large scale wind doesn't deform and change the scale of this feature, it just moves it just pushes it along, okay? So there's, you haven't changed the scale, you, you've just changed the phase, okay? But if you think about it, if this is an error wind, if I have my small scale feature and I change the phase of it, that's now a very big difference between those, those two states. And a very little perturbation, if the scale is small, is gonna be enough to completely decorrelate the states. So completely change the phase. And that means that large scale errors create small scale errors super efficiently, really fast, okay? And Dale Duran has been talking about this point for a little while. So he did the experiment. So, so he, he took this background minus five thirds spectrum, put in the errors at the smallest scale and got this upscale growth. So this is exactly what I showed you on the previous page, okay? But then he did the same experiment. He took this initial error spike and he put it in at the largest scale. So at the large end. And what happens here is quite different. Immediately you see the small scales get scrambled and they grow faster because there's a lot of energy down there. And after a fairly short period of time, you can't really tell the difference between these two experiments, okay? So, if, so it doesn't really matter where you put the error in initially, it blows up on the small scales fast and you get the same general pattern of growth. Um, Duran likes to say though, that this means that butterflies aren't important because the thing that he points out is that to, get an, to have an error on the large scale, that's the same magnitude here, okay? So this, th this would be, say, the butterfly. And, and, th and this would say, well, we've got 100% error amplitude on the butterfly scale, okay? But that amplitude, because there's much less energy down there, is actually a very tiny relative error, like it's orders of magnitude smaller than the background flow on the large scale. So in other words, to get the equivalent of, 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 of the butterfly perturbation, we'd need to reduce our large scale errors by like five orders of magnitude or something, you know, some completely ridiculous value. So there's pretty much no way in practice that a butterfly is ever going to be the cause of an error that matters. Because that would just require absolutely ridiculously perfect knowledge of, of the large scales. So you could say butterflies don't matter, but you could also say that the butterfly effect, or at least the real butterfly effect in terms of this upscale growth might very well matter. Okay, now the Lorentz model was this idealized 2D turbulence model. Let's, have, let's go back and have a look at the, um, at, at, at the realistic model, okay? So if we go back to this global convection permitting experiment of, of Falco Yud, he plotted some spectra from his big simulations Okay, 
And so here's the background specter in, in, in his global model. So he's got this k to the minus three region and he's got this flatter k to the minus five third region. This is why it's important to really have this very high resolution. If you don't, then you won't get this part of the spectrum, okay? And here he plots the error energy every hour for the first 12 hours of his simulation. And what you can see is it's growing fastest on the small scales and you can see how the curves are bunching up here. The error growth is slowing down with time. And this is in fact what you'd expect from the Lorentz model if you're dominated by this minus five thirds energy region, okay? Then he looks later on after this sort of initial growth phase, days three to seven. So this is now every day. And what you can see here is much more evenly spaced lines. So this looks more like the Lorentz model for a minus three spectrum, which is of course we have minus three spectrum we have here. So this is interesting because th this is kind of looking like um, Lorentz's idea works, okay? So just, just to summarize sort of wh where we are then, we've got this fundamental limit in predictability because of the scale interactions. And in the atmosphere, what happens is that whatever perturbation you start with, the small scale, smaller than about 300 kilometers, where you've got this minus five thirds spectrum, will blow up to saturation in one or two days, and you can't improve that limit with more accurate initial conditions, okay? Once you get there, though, then things will grow up to the synoptic scale and, and to the larger scales over a period of about two weeks in this more steady exponential growth regime. So actually most of the length that we can predict the, the, the weather is determined by this process, but the fact that there's a limit comes from this process. Okay, that's sort of where we in Waves to Weather got interested in this problem because it leaves a couple of questions open. The first question is, um, what's the current state of weather prediction? Is there room for improvement? Are we close to the intrinsic limit already? Or have we got another 50 years of making forecasts better? Okay, but there's something else here. So I'm, I'm sort of come from a bit more meteorological background. I teach meteorology courses and, and so on. And when I think about small perturbations growing and things, I think about baroclinic instability and cumulus convection and things that happen fast and blow up in the atmosphere, okay? These are not in the Lorentz model. The Lorentz model is two-dimensional turbulence. It's, it's barotropic. So what's going on here? It seems to work, but is it right for the right reasons? Um, well, let's see. Okay, so let, let, let's, let's now go back to a bit more meteorological perspective about how, how errors grow. So back, um, this is getting, getting on all, all, almost 10 years ago now, Tobias Seltz and I did a convection permitting error growth experiment. We couldn't afford to do it globally. So we did it in a limited area model. But in fact, if, if you look at some animations from Falco Ude's results, it's, it's, it's basically similar, okay? So, so if you look at this picture, so you can see in the black lines, this is the 500 hectopascal geopotential. So just the meteorological situation that we're dealing with. And these blue purple type things are the precipitation. And, what, and the yellow is the error. So this is the difference between two experiments, okay? And what you can see is that about three hours after you introduce the perturbations, and these are these one hundredth of a degree random, random grid scale noise temperature perturbations. So, so really tiny stuff in every sense of the word tiny. Okay, and about three hours later, what you can see is these perturbations have grown substantially, but basically where you've got precipitation. So it's not a uniform thing. It is actually focused on these areas, okay? Now, if you go to 12 hours after it, you can see that now the perturbations are spreading. So the air is spreading out from the convective regions and starting to fill the rest of the domain. If you go to 36 hours, a day and a half, you start to see these red contours appearing. So these red contours are errors in the 500 hectopascal geopotential, okay? And this means that you're not just making energy, on small scales, you're starting to affect the geostrophically balanced part of the flow. So you're starting to get coherent changes 
on these large scales. And these changes amplify with time. So blue and red are just positive and negative an an anomalies. And they're basically filling up most of the domain now and growing in amplitude. So this is sort of a synoptic scale amplification that we're, get, that, that we're getting later. And if you summarize this, there's sort of three stages of error growth going on. I mean, the idea of three stages of error growth actually goes back to a paper by the late great Fujian Tsang, who, who was looking in sort of an idealized baroclinic life cycle, but with a whole bunch of different diagnostics. And he basically said, there's three different stages here. So the first stage is you perturb the precipitation features, okay? And these are mostly actually just spatial displacements, okay? But as soon as you change the perturbation fields, you start getting differences in the gravity wave patterns in the divergent winds that are produced by these systems. And these divergent wind changes eventually go to, to geostrophic adjustment. And after half a day a day, you start seeing differences in the balanced wind. And then in the third stage, you've got errors growing by um, you know, what you might think of as quasi-geostrophic dynamics or large scale processes. Okay, so that's basically the picture that you get if you look at error growth experiments, but this just makes our problem worse, because this is not in Lorentz's model, this is not in Lorentz's model, and this is only partly in Lorentz's model in the sense that he's got the barotropic part of it, but the baroclinic interactions that involve different levels in the atmosphere are omitted there. So what's going on? Okay, so to know what's going on, we've got to get technical again. Okay, because what we, what we really need to know is what's missing in Lorentz's model and how can we measure how well that is. So this is actually a beautiful piece of work. So this is Marlene Baumgart's um, PhD thesis in, in the group of, of Michael Riemer in, in Mainz. And what they did was something that's effectively a generalization of Lorentz's way of looking at it, of, of his framework to the full primitive equations, okay? So in 2D, in 2D vorticity dynamics, the barotropic flow, the vorticity sort of determines everything. You can invert the vorticity, get the wind field and so on. And the analogous quantity for the primitive equations is the potential vorticity, okay? And the potential vorticity is governed by a very similar conservation equation, but there's a couple of crucial differences here. So the advection is now the full three-dimensional advection. Okay, which also includes unbalanced divergent flows. Okay, and there are also non conservative terms. So, this would be diabatic processes, latent heat release, radiation, and so on going on in the model. Okay, but if you start with this equation, you can still start, start, go in the direction that Lorentz did. You can make a PV error equation. And so, what they did was they gave this equation that I've written in this column here in the middle. So it's an equation for, well, delta P is the difference in potential vorticity. We square it, so we've got a potential enstrophy difference, and we see how that changes in time. But rather than separating this out by wave numbers, different scales, the, the way Lorentz did, which would be horrendously complicated, um, we've only looked at the area average. So this is kind of like the total change over, over a, a big region. And so the entropy now changes by a bunch of different processes. Well, you've got these triad interaction terms involving advection, okay? And this is the kind of thing that comes out of this nonlinear advection term. And what they've done, which is really clever here, is separated the winds that are doing the advection into a sort of tropopause level component and the way that, and 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 the deep troposphere, so a baroclinic point, and the way they've done that is done this is by piecewise PV inversion. So what you do is you separate the potential vorticity, and then you do the potential vorticity inversion to get the winds that are associated with upper level features or low level features. And that means you can separate off the sort of barotropic part, tro influences that are coming at the tropopause level, which is the one that Lorentz had from the baroclinic part, so influences that are coming from the lower troposphere and what you need for baroclinic instability, and also the contributions from the divergent wind, okay? You can also, if you know what the tendencies coming from the parameterizations are, estimate the non-conservative term, and then you close off the budget with the residual, okay? I should point out the residual is not small here compared to these other terms. 
However, the residual seems to be mainly diffusive terms. It's mainly a sink. So all these processes here are creating differences, creating error energy, and they're just partially offset by diffusive processes. So this residual is kind of negative and partially offset in these terms. Okay, but that's the beauty of this diagnostic is we, is we can actually separate off um, what's in Lorentz's model from the rest of the things that are going on in, in, in the full models. Okay, so now we have a look at this. Now, another problem with these diagnostics when you start using real models is it gets really noisy. So rather than just doing a single pair of runs, we considered 12 different starting times, so which are basically the first of the month over an entire year. So we've got different kind of weather regimes. And rather than just doing two runs in parallel, we did five member ensembles for each of these cases. So we've got a total of 60 experiments. Okay, 60 experiments takes us out of what we can do with global cloud resolving models. So we've kind of finessed a little bit, cheated a little bit. Um, what we've done is we've used a coarser resolution and we've used a stochastic convection scheme. Okay, so what we see in the high resolution models is the initial growth in the first hour or so is basically the convection decorrelates, the positions of the convective clouds kind of randomizes. And that's what this stochastic scheme does, is it, is it randomizes the location of the, of the convective cells within the sort of envelope of the large scale forcing. So it doesn't move the whole rainy region over, it just randomizes the local convection within it. And that sort of mimics the stage one of Zhang's error growth model. Um, there are a lot of things that could make you skeptical of this. And there's a bunch of tests that we've done, which kind of reassure us partly about some of them and so on. But I've put this in red because this is, this, this is perhaps you know, the biggest limitation of what we've done. And I, and I don't wanna hide that. I don't wanna hide that because I wanna get the budget to do global cloud resolving experiments. Okay, <clears throat> so that's, that's the setup. What do we get out of it? Okay, this is now, the relative magnitude of different terms in that potential entropy equation as a function of time. So over the first six days of the forecast after the perturbations are introduced, and this is the growth rate um, associated with, <coughs> excuse me, with each of these processes. And what you can see here is that different processes dominate at different times. Okay, first thing we get is for the first half day or so, this green curve. Now the green curve is the non-conservative term. So this is the diabatic processes. And in particular, if you go and look at which diabatic process, it's the convection scheme, okay? So initially, the, 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 the PV errors in the upper troposphere are coming directly from, from diabatic sources, okay? But after about half a day, going out for about two days, it shifts over to the divergent wind part, okay? Now, so, so what's going on with divergent wind? Well, if you think about it, in the upper troposphere, there isn't actually a lot of latent heat release, okay? The convection scheme is doing some, but most of the rain, most of the condensation is actually happening lower down in the troposphere. But of course, when the water condenses lower down, the air is warm, it rises up, and it creates an upper level divergence. So whenever you mess with the latent heating somewhere, it actually shows up at tropoplause level as a divergence. So what seems to be going on in this stage is it's still diabatic effects, okay? But it's the error in the, it, it's the, error in the divergent wind and how that affects the background PV gradient. So how it pushes the tropoplause around that's making big PV anomalies. Okay, and that runs out to about two days. And then after two days, the blue curve dominates. The blue curve is the near tropopause dynamics, the barotropic stuff, the stuff that Lorentz actually modeled. So that's actually seems to be what is responsible for most, or for most, for, for the growth through this period after this initial for, for, first, first two days. So what happened to baroclinic instability, the deep tropospheric stuff, that's the yellow line. It's pretty much zero all the way along. Okay, isn't that weird? Okay, what this is saying is, 
It's not saying that baroclinic instability isn't, isn't important. If you think about what's making the energy in the atmosphere, it's coming mostly from baroclinic instability. So baroclinic instability is energizing the background flow. It's making this energy spectrum. But if you want to get fast error amplitude, it's much easier to get it just by pushing something around in space, just by creating a sort of phase error, a barotropic kind of thing, than it is to grow yourself a new cyclone by baroclinic instability. Okay, so we've got three stages of error growth here. Okay, but these first two are not in Lorentz's model, and the third one really seems to be what he was talking about. Okay, so this is the summary of the error growth mechanism. So for the first 12 hours, we've got this small scale diabatic localized stuff. So direct impact of, of convection and so on, very rapid growth. Um, in the next, up to about two days, then you've got sort of mesoscale circulations, things are expanding in space, divergent wind and geostrophic adjustments. So it's getting onto the large scale. And then from there up to, up to saturation for about two weeks, um, I should say I only showed six days of the graph because, but, but, but the experiments run for 30 days. Okay. And it's the barotropic things that, that Lorentz is talking about. So final question then, have we reached the limit? Okay, so we see what the limit is, but are we there yet? Okay, so to do this, we've now extended our set of experiments. So for each of these 12 cases, we now add per initial condition perturbations that are sort of characteristic of what we have now. So we've taken the ECMWF ensemble data simulation system and for each of our five members on each of these days, we draw five members from the ECMWF initial ensemble. So this is their best representation of what our actual uncertainty is in the initial conditions at the moment, given our, our, our observations and so on. We, we leave the stochastic convection stuff in there. And what we do to see the difference is we scale these perturbations. So we, we, we take these initial perturbations and then we run the experiment again, but with only half the amplitude of initial condition perturbations. And then we try 20% and then we try 10%, okay? We also try a 0.1% because that's these minuscule perturbations like our theoretical experiment, okay? And we look for the range in between. By the way, you'll notice now we're up to hundreds of simulations. Okay, so even with um, low resolution, this is starting to, to be a bit of a data management issue. Okay, so what do you get? Okay, let's have a look at these e energy spectra. Okay, so if we look at, um, start, start here on the left-hand side. So this is the 100% experiment. So this is with initial, con condition, initial condition errors like we have now. In, in, in operations. And what you can see is, if you look at these curves, they're basically relatively equally spaced. So we've got this sort of large scale pattern that we would expect with this k to the minus three spectrum. You'll notice we don't have a k to the minus five third spectrum. We don't have enough resolution to see it, okay? And, um, and it seems to be growing pretty much that way, okay? If we George, it, it the, is the spacing between the lines like one day or? Uh, what's the time interval between these lines? I am, um, I believe it's 12 hours. Okay. I'm yeah, not a hundred percent sure though. Actually, I, yeah, I, I, I meant to look that up, but yeah, it's, 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 it's 12 hours or one day. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now, if, if we go to the other end, if we go, if we go now to the really small perturbations, then we see something different. Okay, so the blue line down here, that in, in all of these graphs, the blue line is, is the initial error. And so we can see now that the initial error is, is, is very small and we get a different behavior. We get really rapid error amplification and especially on the small scales. So the maximum in the error amplitude actually moves to smaller scales. Okay, but these smaller scales gradually saturate and then eventually we end up with a similar pattern to what we have here. So these are basically the kind of behaviors that we were seeing. So this is, this is really a lot like Falko-Yud's experiment as well. 
And what we're finding with realistic initial conditions is basically we're starting in this sort of uniform exponential growth period. And you can sort of see as you go to higher and higher resolution, okay, you get longer and longer predictability times. You can start to see when you get down to sort of 10, 20%, the curves are widening out now and the errors are growing faster. Okay. Now, if we look at the processes here, this time, let, let, let's start over here on the left-hand side. So with, with our, our very small amplitude initial con condition perturbations, then these lines here um, are, the, are the, the PV error diagnostics again. I should say this is a slightly simplified version of it. So we didn't do the full PV inversion, which is, is quite expensive and complicated on these hundreds of runs. We did a simplified version where we just split the wind into rotational and divergent components. So that means the baroclinic part is actually included with the barotropic part in the blue curve, but because it's small, so, so very small, um, it, it's not really important. And what you see is again, in the first half day, the black line, the parameterized tendency, which is the convection scheme, dominates. Up to two days, the divergent contribution dominates. And then after that, the sort of rotational barotropic wind. So, th this, so this is basically just another way of looking at the same curve we saw before, okay? If we now go with realistic, so current levels of initial condition error, we see that the rotational stuff dominates right from the start, okay? And this is, this is consistent with the steady error growth rate that we saw on, on the spectral curves as well. But now with this curve, we can see more precisely what happens as we start making our initial condition errors smaller. Because somewhere around 20% or so, you can see at the early times, these other processes are getting similar in amplitude. And by 10%, they're starting to dominate. So we're switching over from this large scale exponential, you know, in theory predictable regime to this multi-scale upscale error growth fundamentally limited when we get our initial per condition perturbations down to somewhere around 10% of the error levels that we have at the moment, okay? And we can summarize that by looking at the predictability time for each of our experiments. And we've defined predictability time as the time when the difference energy reaches 80% of the saturation level. So our error growth curve gets up within 80% of, of, of that level, okay? Um, I, I should stress though, that that's actually a rather poor forecast. Um, it corresponds to an anomaly correlation score of about 0.26, okay? ECMWF, sort of one of their headline scores is how long can they predict with an anomaly correlation of, I think it's 0.5 or 0.6. So in other words, much better. So most users would actually call this a pretty, a pretty bad forecast, but you get similar behaviors, however you define it, you just get different numbers of days. Okay, so if we look for the intrinsic limit, what's the best we can do by making our initial condition errors really small? It's about 17 days by this definition of predictability, okay? If we look at the current initial condition errors, the 100% experiment, so still following the black line, we get about 13 days. So that suggests that we could improve our forecast time by four to five days more if we could perfect our initial conditions, okay? Now that doesn't sound like much, but remember, we've been improving at about one day per decade. So that means there's about 50 years worth of improvements still out there. And that, that'll certainly get me to retirement. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing I, I, I should say, though I haven't really talked about this, is when we do these error growth experiments, these are perfect model experiments, okay? So in the real world, we wouldn't necessarily get this much, imp you know, or, or at least making our initial conditions perfect still wouldn't make a perfect forecast because the models are imperfect. So for reference, we put this purple dot on here. So this is the current level of skill of the ECMWF operational system. Okay, calculated for the same days that we were testing on. And you can see it comes out at about 11 days. So that, that means that if we could perfect the model as well as the initial conditions, we'd actually may be able to get six or seven days of additional predictability, okay? But the other thing you'll see is if you look at this curve, 
So this is showing, okay, better and better initial conditions, longer and longer predictability, bang. We hit the limit somewhere around 10%. Okay, so that's the same thing that we saw with the switchover of processes. That's really where the limit of predictability is. So let me sum up, okay? So currently, by this measure we've got, we've got a practical predictability limit of something like 13 days or so, okay? And the reason for this is we've got error growth due to barotropic processes around the tropopause level, pretty much just like Lorentz said back in 1969, okay? If we make our initial conditions better, we can increase this limit by something on the order of four to five days until we get our errors down to about 10% of their current levels. And at that point, we reach the intrinsic limit where rapid growth of errors on small scales, these convective divergent diabetic processes prevent further improvement. Okay, and at that point, you know, so we take our current temperature errors of say one Kelvin or so nowadays, we get them down to about a 10th of a Kelvin. We keep making the forecast better, but from a 10th to a hundredth to whatever doesn't help significantly. Okay, so that's really where, where we've got to with this. I'd like to finish off by saying, of course, we're not really done with this. There are some open questions here. Um, the first one I'd like to highlight is forecast busts. So how good the forecast is depends very much on the weather situation on that day. So we've considered um, um, averages over a whole lot of different weather situations. But what about days when the forecasts are especially bad, when you've got really rapid error growth? Could that be cases where the diabetic processes are really kicking in strongly and we've hit the intrinsic limit? even with our current systems, not because our initial condition errors are getting small, but because the error growth rates, the intrinsic predictability limit is getting shorter. So that's the first thing, okay. Second thing is the tropics. Now in the tropics, we know from these model experiments, errors grow slower. So there's the same rapid initial growth, but then the growth rates are slower, okay. Maybe this is because we haven't got the strong sort of 2D turbulent barotropic kind of flow that you have in the mid latitudes. So the sort of interactions that you get don't really exist. But in that case, what is determining the predictability time in the tropics, okay? And the final point is um, with our limited number of experiments, we've got a signal to noise ratio problem. So we picked this 80% threshold because that's about as accurate as we can do it with the noise, okay? Um, if you really extend to very, um, if, if you have really good statistics, you can look for very slight degrees of predictability, and that might go on much longer. And of course, there's, there are also other processes on longer timescales that don't show up in our system. So interaction with the Earth system, oceans, land surface interactions, and so on. And so the whole question of predictability on longer time scales, you know, the S2S seasonal, the subseasonal stuff, is really not addressed in our statistics. And of course, that's another really fun area as well. Okay, and with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Great talks. Yeah, uh, let's open it up for questions. <clears throat> Uh, I see Mingwa actually raised your hand first, so Mingwa. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Georgie, for this very inspirational talk, and you really described this so clearly for such a complicated project, problem. Uh, one technical question I have is, uh, in your experiments with different uh, magnitude of initial error, like 0 0.1 to 100% uh, percent. Why, like uh, when the error is larger, the physics part, the diabetic heating contribution becomes smaller? Ah, okay. It's, 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 it's the relative contribution becomes smaller. So what really happens is the barotropic processes are just much bigger initially. Okay. 
and they just swamp the other stuff. So this oh, is so the diabetic oh, stuff is going on at the same intensity all the time, but the other stuff is just so much stronger. Okay, okay. So it is the total error in this uh, potential vorticity uh, growth. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah. yeah, if you just think of the energy spectrum, you're starting up here, not down here. Okay, okay. That's why it, it seemed to be very small. The second question is regarding the consistency among the variables. That probably matters too, is that right? Imagine like if it's a local no, normal mode, then the growth probably won't be that much because they cancel out. However, if it's not balanced, then the growth probably would be larger. Does that, that matter? Um, it, 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 it certainly could matter. I mean, what, what, what matters though is not so much the structure of the perturbations because basically everything kind of spreads and scrambles really quickly anyway, this sweeping mechanism. Okay. What matters a lot is the structure of the of, of, of the total flow, of the average flow. So different weather situations that have different things going on. Like if, 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 if you look right in the middle of a growing baroclinic cyclone, or if you look in a blocking event, then you will see very different things. So it's, it's, it's really what the mean flow is doing that matters. And the perturbations, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I, I I can't actually say you're wrong because I haven't done the experiment and, and, and it could be that things matter, but at least the stuff we've got so far sort of suggests that it's, it's, it's the mean flow that matters, like the, the overall state, not the details of the perturbation. I mean, we, we tried, for example, um, doing different kinds of perturbations. So doing a large scale geostrophically balanced perturbation versus perturbing one grid point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in those experiments that I showed the pictures of, made no difference. Okay. The error growth started where the convection was, grew up the same way. Okay, interesting. Thank you. So, Kevin, you are the second to raise your hand. Yeah, I have maybe, maybe two questions, but maybe they're more of a co comments, and I'm curious for your take on them. The first is related, so you talked a little bit about the uh, impact of resolution of the model um, on the ability to um, to simulate aspects of, of this kinetic energy spectra. And I'm curious what your, there has been work that's shown that even at really coarse resolution, um, let's say uh, typical of a conventional climate model at hundred kilometers, that you can actually, that if you run your, if you run a radiative convective equilibrium, so you kind of remove the large scale and, and baroclinic role, um, that you can actually capture this mesoscale slope even at really coarse resolutions with, uh, with convective parameterizations. So I guess I, I'm just curious of what your thoughts and how that kind of fits into to, um, kind of that the breakdown that you were showing towards, towards the end. And then another comment I have, which is maybe more on the model development side, which I know you said there's other folks working on kind of improvements in, um, in the convection schemes and things like that, but I'm curious, there's been a lot of, there's been work that could show and, and climate modelers, for example, do this, but they don't often publish it. They actually look at the kinetic energy spectra really early on in simple test cases, like a bare clinic wave test case. And they look to see what their kinetic energy spectra is. And, and they actually tune um, numerical divergence and divergence damping in their dynamical core uh, to try to fit some of these curves at, at, at the resolutions they're operating at. And I'm curious if your thought is if that's actually a good thing to be doing, or if that's kind of, I mean, I mean this is, the, you know, the parameterizations are thought to be outside of the dynamical core, but in, in practice, there's actually parameterizations within the dynamical core to some extent. I'm just curious if you had a, a thought on whether that's the right approach to be kind of developing models. Um, I mean, that, that, that's a very, very big question. So I'm just gonna answer the little teeny bit that's related to what I talked about today, which is error growth on, on the small scales. And, and, and the point about, about that is um, you really need, you, 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 you need the, the variability, you, you, you need to somehow get the variability on the small scales. So the stochastic perturbation matters. 
because you know, regardless of how you tune the diffusion, how you sort of tune the energy spectrum or, or whatever, um, if you don't put that variability in, um, you won't get enough error growth. Like if, if, if we did our experiments, you know, this is one of the sensitivity tests we tried, of course, is just using a conventional deterministic convection scheme and the errors grow slower. Okay, because, because you're missing that, that, that variability. Okay, um, the first part of your question though is, is actually something that's really interesting. So if you look at the energy spectrum that I showed, the sort of classic mid-latitude thing, you've got this flat K to the minus five thirds region, then you've got the K to the minus three. Now the K to the minus three is basically a downscale entropy cascade. And this comes from those sort of bare tropic dynamics sort of things, okay. And it is true, there's been lots of experiments say basically if you take out all that sort of synoptic scale mid-latitude stuff and just have the convection, then yeah, you'll get this minus five thirds going all the way up. But, but, but the thing is, as soon as you put the other stuff in, it's like orders of magnitude bigger and you, and you, and you just don't see the other stuff anymore, okay. But this is where the tropics are interesting because the tropics are the experiment where you take that mid-latitude dynamics out. And so exactly how errors spread upscale in that and what the relationship is between what, what is now on synoptic scales, relatively low energy, which means background waves, Kelvin waves and things start to start to have more influence than they would in the really turbulent mid latitudes. And so that's actually a really interesting problem. So yeah, so my take is just cool. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> awesome, thank okay, you. I think Brian has the next question. Hey, George, excellent talk. Um, yeah, my question is sort of related to Mingwaz and maybe your last slide. You were talking at least briefly about forecast busts. And so, you know, you mm -hmm. present a limit of, you know, 13 days, but, in, you know, in the real world, we have situations that can be a few days up to 13 plus days. And so I just, uh, maybe I missed it. I just want to get your read on, you know, what's, what's going on differently in that spectrum of predictability. Uh, and I was actually thinking, ming where uh, you have the latent heating, you have the handover to the divergence, you know, is there more room for convective latent heating to, to all of a sudden uh, give you enhanced air growth that would accelerate the process even more than, than that simple handoff? Uh, so I'm just wondering wh what's different between those two levels? Right. Well, I mean, in, in terms of the initial part with the latent heat release, I mean, the, 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 the thing that I kind of get out of this is that what really matters to, to, to what the error growth is, is what the basic flow is doing. So just think of what your control forecast is doing. So if your control forecast has a lot of latent heat release, has a lot going on, then small scale errors will grow fast because you take that flow, you tweak it in any way and it blows up, okay? Whereas if you've got a very stable large scale pattern, you know, you've got a block and there's not much going on in it, um, then the same perturbations just won't have the same effect in it. So, but that, that's a very sort of hand wavy answer. Um, in fact, that's our big project for the next couple of years is to actually do an even bigger set of experiments um, and, and start classifying it by season geographical region. So we're trying to generalize these PV diagnostics to something that we can apply locally and actually sort of track, because as soon as you start getting local, you've got to be a little bit Lagrangian and track cyclones and features as they go. So it's actually kind of, kind of messy. And then start looking at, at, at some of these dependencies in, in detail. So I've, my, my intuition is, that you just look at what the core flow is doing and it tells you sort of what the sensitivity is. Um, but, but to make that quantitative is, is, is a challenge because you know, if you think about these, so Mark Rodwell at ECMWF has been looking at these forecast busts. So places where basically the skill goes almost to zero even in a six day forecast, okay? And when he looks at them from the meteorology and tracks them back, they always come back to something like a, uh, an extra uh, a tropical cyclone making a transition into the extra tropics or a huge flare up of convection on the US continent, which then disrupts European weather six days later. And so it, it always seems to come back to these sort of sensitive, sensitive regions, I guess. You're old enough to remember Thorpex. 
Thank you, George. Yeah, uh, Malcolm, uh, you have a question? Oh, thank you, George, for a fascinating talk. Um, this is a non-meteorologist speaking, but just some random thoughts. The very first slide you showed of the improvement in weather forecasts in Melbourne, Australia, how much is, is that, is that a sort of universal experience? But of course, Melbourne's at the southeast corner of a very large continent, maybe 5,000 kilometers east to west. I grew up in Auckland, New Zealand, 1,600 miles to the east downstream where the country's about two miles wide. And we had, we have a, we had a very different weather and climate. So if you, if you did that sort of analysis, in other cities, you grew up in the Canadian prairies just east of the Rockies. So how, how would, the, I mean, I, my gut feeling is that that kind of um, improvement forecasting is kind of universal. But the second question was, um, you know, obviously weather, better weather forecasts are due to more weather stations reporting, better numerical models and better educated meteorologists and from a consumer point of view, I mean, obviously we benefit from uh, better data assimilation. Uh, that's not part of your talk, I realize that, but um, if, if we're starting to see 15 day forecasts here on the East Coast of the US and, you know, it's encouraging, but how much of our perception as a consumer is based on, if we watch the weather map every day and with fading memory, as you go from day one to day 15, you may be, just remembering day six or seven or something, and you say, well, that's great. And that's not a scientific explanation, I know, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, I mean, th th this issue of perception of weather forecasts and how people think about weather forecasts at long ranges when the skill start, where there's skill there, but it's, it's low skill is actually um, something, that, something that there's a lot of research going on actually in social sciences and so on, because what you end up doing is you're doing probabilistic forecasts, but you don't have a lot of confidence. So, you know, because if someone predicts 90% rain, you know what to do. If someone predicts 30% rain, yeah, you know, that doesn't really help much at all. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's, there's a lot of this, this kind of thing going on. I mean, to get back to your first point about this sort of curve that, I'm that, that I was showing for, for, for Melbourne, um, that's pretty universal. So in fact, usually when you see this kind of diagram, you, you see the ones that are produced by the European Center because they, they churn them out regularly. And they're usually doing averages for, the, for the, say the Northern Hemisphere or something like that. So you do see a pretty consistent pattern there. Um, and you're absolutely right. This is related to better models, better observations, and better data assimilation. I'm actually glad you brought that up because that, that has been a very crucial part of this. And one of the clever things that the European Center has been doing is they, they do these reanalysis things where they go back and assimilate all the old observations with a modern data assimilation system and get sort of a, a good quality data set for the atmosphere. But they've done something else, which, which is probably less famous, is they've done reforecasts on this. So they've gone back through this historical period and run forecasts with a modern model off this modern data analysis. And so, because then you can say how much of the improvement is really just the observations on their own. Okay, and it's kind of interesting because if you look at what observations matter around the world now, number one is something called AMSU, Advanced Microwave Sounding Unit. So basically it's a passive microwave instrument that measures the temperature structure of the atmosphere. But if you have geostrophic balance, that basically gives you the wind field and so on. And because it's global, that, that's sort of the number one observation that you can't live without. So, so when those things came online, like 20 years ago or something, actually 25 years ago, nothing happened. It took 10 years to be able to assimilate them and the forecast skills jumped. Um, but, but then you had that improvement. And, and since then it's kind of been more actually models and refinements of the data assimilation that's made a difference. So it, it's a pretty complicated story, but it's absolutely fascinating because of the interplay between all these different ingredients that you, that you, that you described. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's getting late, but I actually have a question which is kind of more fundamental level is that all this 
uh, kind of like perfect model uh, analysis, like what you uh, you actually described at the end, is that basically you are assuming that the model is a faithful representation of the atmosphere. Now, uh, I haven't looked at the uh, predictability at this range, but actually uh, in sort of longer, uh, longer time range, uh, for example, the NAO and even for storm tracks, what we find is that if we look at the differences between ensemble, uh, basically ensemble member predicting each other, they actually predict each other worse than they predict the actual weather, which suggests that uh, the, the, it's not our own work also. We, we did some work on that, but uh, I think several other groups have shown that uh, for NAO, for example, the models predict the actual evolution of the NAO better than they predict each other's prediction, each ensemble member. So that suggests that the models actually produce too much noise. Uh, it, one of the one, yeah, one of the possibilities that actually the models actually produce too much noise among themselves. And is that possible to something like that uh, is happening also at the other scale uh, that you are talking about? Um, it's possible, of course. I don't think so, though. So, so yeah, so I mean, th this is what sometimes they call the signal to noise ratio paradox as well. I've, I've heard that term too, where, where the models basically have too much random variability in noise. And if you average that stuff out, you pick up a, a real signal. I doubt that that's going on on sort of the mid latitude synoptic scale kind of geostrophically balanced dynamics. The models are really good at that. That's sort of the one thing that we get best in the whole atmospheric modeling on any scale is we get the sort of large scale synoptic kind of fluid dynamics part of it, correct? I mean, people are thinking about this kind of thing a lot because of course the big question nowadays is could you throw out the dynamical model and just replace it with a, a neural network or something like that? You know, could, could you just train it? And I think for those kinds of scales and that kind of motion, you probably will, won't do better than the current models that solve what seem to be the laws of physics and solve it accurately. Anything that starts depending on parameterizations, other parts of the Earth system, and so on, is, is kind of up for grabs. I think in, I, your that, that's early, my in your early growth, that seems to be the ultimate limit is actually the, the smaller scale rather than the geostrophic. Uh, large scale. Uh, so is there any possibility that the models are producing too much noise in that, those scales? Mm. Um, I, 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 absolutely. I, I mean, th there's probably a tendency to have too much diffusion and not produce enough variability. I mean, most of the time you see the energy spectrum actually nosedives instead of, instead of flattening out. Um, but but it, 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 it certainly is, is possible. I, I, don't, I don't lie awake at night worrying about that one because you would have to slow down or reduce that variability so much that it would start taking a week for these small scale errors to kind of grow up to the other size before you'd actually affect the predictability limit. Because all, all you need is to be fast compared to the two weeks of the synoptic growth and and it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that we've, we've kept you long enough. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's great to see you. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. And it was a great discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, George.